everyone, and welcome to another episode. Today, I am really excited to have a goat breeder with me, and that is Ellen Dorsey of Dill's Goats in Oklahoma. She raises Nigerian dwarfs, alpines, and Toggenbergs, and in the past has also raised Nubians and a few mini dairy goats. She also happens to have been on the board of the American Dairy Goat Association for the past 10 years and also on the board of the American Nigerian Dwarf Dairy Association. In her spare time, she raises cattle. Just kidding, she has no spare time. (laughs) Um, Because she's also doing linear appraisal with her goats and milk testing and showing. Basically, she does all the things. There is literally nothing left that you can do with goats that Ellen does not do. Welcome to the show today, Ellen. (laughs) Nice to see you. Ellen and I, I guess we kind of met online, but then more when we were both on the board of the American Nigerian Dwarf Dairy Association. Um, That was probably seven or eight years ago. And uh, I'm not doing that anymore, but Ellen is just a glutton for punishment. So she just keeps going with all of these boards and everything. And there's so many things we could talk about, but what I really want to talk about today, because it's May, so we're pretty much, well, up here in Illinois, we're at the beginning of show season, down south, they're already into the thick of it. And so for people who thought about showing, um, I thought this would be a really great time to talk to somebody who's been doing this for a really long time. So when did you start showing? Well, I've been breeding for 22 years, so I think we started showing around 21 years ago because we were relatively new in dairy goats when we went to our first show. Okay, and why did you decide to do it? It seems like maybe it would be interesting. It just, you know, we had uh, we saw some different folks talking about it on the list, you know, we could back then we had the Yahoo groups. You remember that? I'm I sure. remember. Yeah. <laughs> talking about it and posting pictures and, and that sort of thing. And we thought, well, why not? There was one, a show up in Springfield and it was a close enough drive to us. So I got, found all the information I needed and got my health certificate and all those lovely things. And of course we had to have a scrapies identification number back then, which we, you know, we have to have now as well, but that's when I got my ID number so we could cross state lines and, um, and we attended our first show and that was an eye opening experience. (laughs) It's very, very different. (laughs) So can you expand on that a little bit? What was so eye-opening about it? Well, you know, when you first get, get, my very first goats were actually uh, pygmy type goats. They weren't registered. I always say I cut my teeth on them. I learned how to deal with goats with those few pygmy goats. And a friend of mine offered me a couple of Nigerian dwarves. They needed rehoming. They belonged to a friend of hers. And I thought, well, sure, you know. So they came over and we thought, well, these are kind of cool, you know, and you can milk them and, you know, that sort of thing. So we thought, well, let's get a few more. So we kind of looked around and we picked up a few more. And we had this little tidy little group. And I don't even remember how many at that point, maybe 12, 13 animals. And so we decided to, to go to that first show. And we took these animals that we had purchased and well, we found out that our animals were not very good. (laughs) And they were a much different type than what was walking around in that show ring and having a livestock background anyway, I could see it immediately. Oh, ours look way different, you know, so that it just opened up a whole new world. And so when we went home, we knew that one of the first things we were going to have to do was sort out what wasn't going to work and find something that would work. And so that was the beginning of the crazy, (laughs) getting lots of goats and keeping those few individuals that we felt like were a step in the right direction and then culling everything else. And of course, right after that, I sold my pygmy herd and, you know, and we focused strictly on the Nigerians at that point and a few Alpines and, you know, Nubians, you know, because once you start buying registered animals, you just, you just got to have more. That's just the way it is. 
Right. Yeah. That's just the way it is. <laughs> so I know when um, I was back in the early 2000s, when I was getting started with goats, I remember on the Yahoo groups, a lot of people saying that going to shows was a good way to learn more about goats, especially like confirmation and the way that they should look and move and how the udder should look and everything. Um, so is that really, did you really learn a lot in the early years from the shows? Yes, I really did. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to listen to the judge when you're in the ring and he's giving his reasons, but it's really important to try. You should listen to what they're saying, you know, and of course they give comparative reasons. They don't go, well, this one just doesn't cut it because her pasterns are bad. You know, they're not going to say that. They're going to say that the animal standing ahead of her um, ha is more correct. And she's, you know, she's stronger on her feet and legs, you know, things like that. They're not going to pick something specific and say it's bad about your animal. They're going to give comparisons. And of course, that spares the exhibitor's feelings too, you know, that they're not picking your animal apart, but they're telling you why the animal in front of you is better. And then when they get to your animal, they, they say why the one, why she's better than the one following her, you know, you see what I mean? And so if you pay attention, you pick up quite a bit of information just by what that judge is telling you and the reasons. If you decide to go just to watch, you can watch those animals walking around the ring and it's very easy to pick up on the differences. You pick up on who has the better top line, who's standing on stronger feet and legs, who's walking better. Um, and then of course the mammary system is a whole nother universe. Um, and you can see which ones are higher and tighter, which ones have a lot of movement and sway when the doe is walking. Um, which one has the appropriate roundness up in the escutcheon, um, the appropriate uh, perpendicular teeth, or, it, you know, you, you can see these things as you watch these animals move around the, the ring, if you pay attention. Right. That's one of the things that I think surprised me that I was not expecting, because I'd been to dog shows before, and if you're at dog shows, the judges are just walking around in silence, you know, and, and you can't read their mind. And so I was a little confused when people said, oh, you can learn a lot about goats by going to the shows because I wasn't really prepared for the way that they were going to talk about the goats. And so I, I love that part about showing. I mean, it's one thing I miss is and that they are very positive, you know, like they, they talk about the goat that they put in first place and how how good she looks, what all her strengths are. Yeah. And then. And then they go all the way down the line and they always say something nice, even about the dough at the end. Yeah. Um, in fact, I remember like the, one of the first goats that we ever bought that we took to shows, um, we used to, we, it became a running joke that like we always knew the judge was going to say, and the dough at the end of the line should be commended for her length of body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they always find something nice. And, and that's, that it's very important, you know, because if they stand there and say, you know, rude things about the animals in the, in the lineup, then why would you go back? You know, no one wants to be abused. You want to see the positive. And so that, that also makes, you know, shows a lot of fun. Um, and, and you see the positive traits of each animal, and then you can determine whether or not you want those positive traits uh, in your own, own breeding program. And, and it's, it's just, I don't know, it, it really helps make you a better breeder, in my opinion. What are some of the things that you feel like you changed as a result of your showing? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I always said early on, I felt like a used goat dealer because I was trying to find the few handful of individuals that could actually be the foundation of my herd. Because when I went to that first show, I found out I didn't have it. You know, those were not foundation type animals. That's not the traits you wanted to move forward with. You wanted to find something that was pretty to look at, um, had the correct function that you were looking for, which in a dairy goat obviously is milk production. Um, but then you want that the udder health as well. It's not just all about milk. That udder needs to be held up nice and high and tight against the body uh, so it doesn't get damaged. 
uh, in her day-to-day -day life. And so, you know, I saw those kind of things um, in the show ring, the nice things that I wanted, and I wanted goats like that too. And so I ended up, but back in those days, that was the interesting thing. Back in those days, you couldn't buy one animal unless you were just buying a baby goat. I didn't want a baby goat. I wanted a doe. I wanted a doe that had an udder, that had some production, that I could see what she was doing. Preferably one that had a tiny little bit of age on her. You know, I wasn't looking for a first freshener. I was looking for more like a four or five, six year old. Something that had been around the block um, she, is she still on strong feet and legs? Is she, is her udder still up there nice and tight? Does she have that depth of body we want to see? Is she still level along that, that top line? You know what I'm saying? And, and so, you know, I had to look around for those kind of things and you couldn't buy one of those. Not back then, you know, because as you know, when you and I were in Andada, we were still considered a rare breed back then. Now the breeds exploded, you know, and they're the most common animal uh, and the fastest growing breed in the country. Um, certainly the fastest growing breed in Adga, um, and we outpaced the Nubians in a big way uh, in the American Dairy Goat Association. So um, I ended up having to buy herds. So people who had a herd for sale, I'm your man. <laughs> and I bought herds. And then I'd bring them home and I'd milk them and live with them for just a little bit. And I'd go, okay, you'll do. And I'd keep the one that I actually went after in the first place and maybe a herd mate if she was a good one too. And then I'd sell the rest. And I sold, I bought and sold a lot of goats for two or three years before I finally got that foundation in my doe herd that I really wanted. And then of course, I, I always say my herd is based on two bucks because it is. Um, I had one of my early bucks was Promised Land CP Bounty Hunter. And the other one was Twin Creeks LS Luck of the Draw. And I taught Keith Harrell out of Luck of the Draw about Bounty Hunter when he was a kid. And my herd was bounced back and forth on those two bucks for a number of years. And then, and even then I started, I kept sorting just continually sorting and sorting out anything that I didn't feel like met my criteria. And today, 22 years later, my entire herd traces back to those two bucks and five dollars. I love what you just described now, because one of the things I remember, like back when we were showing with me and my daughters, um, you would see someone new come to the show with like a couple of goats, which you knew they dearly loved because they just bought these two goats and they, they're thinking, you know, I just bought these two wonderful pets that, and this is going to be their forever home. And it is a completely different mindset when you are buying livestock than when you are buying like a puppy or a kitten or something. And mm -hmm. we did the same thing, you know, in the beginning, we, the first from 2002 to 2005, we bought so many goats, but we also sold a lot of them because like they would freshen once and we'd be like, mm, no, mm -mm, not going to keep you. <laughs> and, and then at that point, by 2005, we had so many does that we've, we've never bought a doe since 2005. And that's where I think some people, well, there's two problems. First, they, they don't realize that the first goats they buy are not going to be their forever goats. Like right. you're going to be learning and, and you're probably, if you might get lucky, but it's, you're talking yeah. luck here. You know, if, if that goat gets to stick with you long-term um, because 80, 90% of the goats that we bought in those first three years did not stay with us more than a year or two. Um And then on the flip side, you have people that just can't stop themselves from continuing to buy goats forever. And if you do that, you're never going to establish your ideal of a good goat. If you're just bringing in new genetics constantly like that, do you want to talk about that some more? Well, um, I think everybody that knows who I am, I, I say all the time, I'm a line breeder to the soles of my feet and, and I line breed constantly. 
Um, and of course, we have a run and joke. If it doesn't work out, it's inbred. <laughs> you know, if it works out well, then it's a well lined bred goat. <laughs> um, but that also brings you consistency in your type. And so if you look at my herd now, especially, you look at my herd and you look at each individual, um, I like to put up comparative pictures sometimes because if all you did was change its hair coat, it's the same goat over and over and over and over. And I keep repeating the same goat over and over and over again. They just happen to be different colors. And the reason I've managed to do that is because of my line breeding mentality. I keep it that way. I don't buy goats uh, unless it's a buck. I bring in a new buck every couple of years. Well, probably more like four or five years. I'll bring in a new buck because you've got to introduce something new sometimes to keep the vigor in your herd. Um, and then two, you're always trying to correct something. You know, I'm always trying to make it better. They've got to be better. They, one of the things here recently that I've really focused on is the crops, which are the shoulders. Um, and if there's a lot of movement in the crops, well, mine do that and I don't like it. So I've been really working to tighten that up, you know, tighten that area. But you don't want to lose anything in translation. So, you know, I keep line breeding on what I know and adding a little bit of this in here somewhere. And typically it's two or three generations down before you really see what that animal has done. It's not usually, it's not that first generation. Sometimes it's not even the second generation that you see the improvement for why you added that particular animal. Um, but so if you want, I mean, to me, I always say the fastest way to get consistency in your herd. Of course, you want it to be consistently good, not consistently bad. But the fastest way to do that is through line breeding um, and, and getting a type set in your mind that you want. And that's what you're constantly focusing on, that type. What do you want? And for me, I want an excellent animal. I want animals that are praise high. Um, and so I have this type in my head and I just keep working at those traits that would give me that excellent animal. That's a really good point. I think so many people just look at the hair and, um, or the eye color, you know, and they're like, cause I actually just got an email from somebody a couple of days ago saying that, you know, she had this cute little baby buck that was born that has moon spots. And she's like, can I keep it? Should I keep him as a buck? And <laughs> it's like, and I asked her, I'm like, well, it depends on what your goals are for your breeding program, you know? Um, in my mind, like every time I'm looking at baby bucks, I'm just like, give me a reason to not castrate you. <laughs> it's like, it's pretty much every buck that, that is born here is going to be castrated unless his mom is, is just, you know, she's got to be one of my best milkers in terms of production. I've got to love her udder. I've got to love her teats. Because that's our main focus is on the dairy aspect is that we want to be raising really good little backyard milkers that are going to be productive and easy for people to milk. And nowhere does, does eye color or coat color play into that. You, you get no points in the show ring. You get no points in the milk bucket based on any of those things. You cannot milk that. It's pretty, but you can't milk that. So yeah, no, and like you, um, my full-time job is a farmer and I actually run a dairy from, you know, from here and I milk anywhere between 50 and 60 does twice a day. That's what I do. They have to have production or they don't need to be here. And, and so I tell people all the time, you've got to pay attention to the does. Um, the does that are ahead of her and the does that are behind her, uh, her daughters, you know, and of course I'm taught, thinking ancestry, you know, her dam, her sire's dam, her sisters, uh, his sisters, her, the dam sisters, you know, what, what do the does do in those lines? And that's how you want to focus your program. Look at the does. I don't care how pretty a buck is. I don't care how many awards he's won. In fact, I, I haven't shown him a buck in years and years and years because I have no respect for him. Um, that's a terrible thing to say, <laughs> but I really don't, you know, they have one purpose. 
They have one purpose and that's to make children, <laughs> you know? And so he needs to have a correct dam and he has, his sire's uh, dam has to be correct. And all the female relatives just have to be wonderful for them to come and look at my does, you know? That's just the way it works. And so I, I know I answered a question the other day on Facebook, they were talking about uh, dam lines and sire lines. And I told them, if you don't pay attention to the dam lines, you will fail. You will. It doesn't matter what they do in the show ring it, or, or what a buck does in the show ring. It really has no bearing whatsoever on your yeah. breeding program. It's your does that matter. About 10 years ago, I bought a new buck because I'm like you. I All I ever buy is I buy a new buck every four or five years to get some new blood here. And I think it was about 10 years ago, I bought a new buck and the breeder was so excited and she kept emailing and saying, what do you think of him? What do you think of him? And I'm like, I'll let you know in three years when, when his daughters are on their second freshening. <laughs> yep, ex exactly. <laughs> but like I said, even that, sometimes it's three generations down before you ever really see the impact that that animal has had on your program. Um, I don't like to, I, don't, I hate outcrossing. Outcrossing makes me crazy. Uh, because you never know what they're going to do. You know, they could come in with some kind of shim shally thing that you don't ever want to see. And you don't know until you cross them with your beloved does, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and so it might be, but you brought him in for a trait. So you're going to hang in there and you keep uh, a few daughters. You keep, uh, you know, a granddaughter, um, a, a friend, a mutual friend, probably Tom Rucker. He likes to keep a son. You know, he'll breed his does and he'll keep a son and then he uses that son on his herd and, you know, gets rid of the original one. I tend to keep daughters because I want to see, you know, quickly, in my opinion, what those daughters do. So we have a little bit of a difference on how we do things, but we still do things very, very similar. And, and you know, so it may be, like you say, three years later before you actually see what that buck has done. And for me, it's in the uh, subsequent offspring rather than that first generation. Because a lot of times that first generation just doesn't work out very well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I keep, what I do is I initially keep like four or five daughters. And then if I like the daughters, then I will keep a son. Yes, that's me too. I'm the same. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to keep a son. Cause one thing that did happen to me like a long time ago was, was I did keep a son early on. I kept, I kept him and his sister both and his sister literally turned out to be like one of the worst two or three milkers I ever had. And oh. I was just horrified that I had bred her brother to some of my other does. I was just like, Oh no. <laughs> I was back a few years ago when, you know, we had a lot of our shows um, had the senior doe, junior doe, buck show, you know, everything was all in combined, you know, and it was before we were in AGA. And so our AGS show, you tended to have all of the, the three um, shows together, you know, so you saw a lot of um, <clears throat> the bucks and things like that, too, at those shows. And there was, I remember this pair, a doe and her brother, of course, a buck. <laughs> um, and the sister was constantly at the back of the line where she belonged because her udder was absolutely horrific. But that buck, he championed just really, really fast. He was beautiful. Beautiful, you know, long bodied, nice stance, you know, uphill, everything you'd want to see in a show box. And he was absolutely beautiful. But his sister was yucky. <laughs> and, and, but, and people, for some reason, people were still go, I want a buck out of that buck. And I'm thinking, why would you do that to your program? You saw his sister, didn't Yeah, <laughs> And, and, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a different mindset, um, buying animals or, you know, based on a show win for a buck. Don't do it. You Check out the does. You, 
trust me, I promise it will work out <laughs> better. I promise. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That was another thing I learned that I learned too in the early years. Um, I bought a, I actually bought a two-year-old or three-year-old buck at a show. He was gorgeous. He won champion that day. And I was just like, I want to buy that buck. And, and I bought him right there at the show and um, had not looked at his pedigree very well. I wound up not keeping a single doe out of him more than two years. Yeah. Like they were just, none of them had a good udder or teeth and their milk production was substandard. Mm -hmm. And I, it was just horribly disappointing. And um, it was a good lesson though, you know, and <laughs> you did learn, I mean, it, hopefully it might take a few years, <laughs> you know, to get it figured out. But if, you know, if older breeders can save younger breeders a little bit of heartache, you know, don't do that. You know, yeah. pay attention to the does because that really, truly in a dairy breed, that's what's important. Not those bucks. It's, it's the does. Yeah. And that's another thing too. I remember when I was new to goats, I was looking at websites because um, Nigerian breeders, I feel like have always been very serious since the, as long as I've been doing this and they, they've had websites and they had, you know, pictures of their does that are clipped, you know, show clipped, they have pictures of their udders. And when I was new, I was like, that is so weird. Why do they have pictures of the udders? <laughs> and, and then after, you know, like two or three years, I'm like, oh, now I understand. And then it's like, you know, and, and you can tell like new people are always like, oh, I want to see baby pictures. And experienced people are like, I want to see mom's udder. I want to see grandma's udder on both sides. I want to see milk production records. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. I tell my buyers all the time too. Um, you know, they want, you know, they're interested in, in purchasing offspring, you know, and I'll say, well, here's one picture. That's all you're going to get. <laughs> and, and the kid might be laying down for all I know, you know, because sometimes they don't want to stand up and take that bottle pretty. But so you got a color shot. This is what the kid looks like, you know. Now, if you come and ask me to take 80 pictures of that kid for you, it's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm really, really busy. But here's his mom. I'll show you his mom or her mom, <laughs> you know, because that's what you should be looking at anyway. You should be looking at the females in the pedigree. Yeah, exactly. So what are, if somebody was thinking about showing goats, what is some advice that you would give them about getting started? <clears throat> well, you need a lot of money because <laughs> <laughs> it's not cheap. <laughs> um, it takes a lot of energy, um, but you want to be really organized, put together a tack, you know, your tack box. You're always going to forget something. So, you know, figure out where the closest Walmart is to your show location, because you're going to be there, <laughs> you know, I mean, you just are, you're going to forget your extension cord or something, you know, you're going to forget something. Um, <clears throat> but you want to be really organized. Um, you want to make sure that you're hauling your animals comfortably. That's something that we're uh, really big on is um, the comfort and care of the animal. Uh, so she needs to have some room to move around, even if you carry them in crates, which is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with using dog crates to move your Nigerian dwarves around. Uh, I wouldn't do it with an alpine, you know, because they don't make a crate big enough. You're going to have to want a, you know, a box on the back of your truck or a trailer. Um, we happen to use a trailer. Um, but she needs to have plenty of room to get up and move around and spin around in that box without being uncomfortable um, to, you know, because it, it's very important that they travel well, because if they don't, they might be sick. They're not going to have any milk in their udder, something, something is going to happen if they're not comfortable on that trip. And of course, you always want them on clean bedding um, and, and just you know, and, and that they've got plenty of airflow and that they're kept cool or warm, depending on the time of the year, whatever you're doing. If it's cooler, put a coat on her, you know, and, and be kind, uh, because it's just really important to move them about uh, in a good way, you know, where the animal is comfortable. Because that should be first and foremost in your mind. <clears throat> Beyond that, you should have a nice tack box with the few things you need, your show collars, maybe a set of clippers if you need to clip out your udders. 
Um, we have a tie out chain. If I'm going a long distance, I keep a first aid kit for the goats and for myself uh, because inevitably someone's going to need a band aid or, you know, the goat might. Uh, something awful. I mean, you just never know. Something awful might happen and she needs some medication. And if you have it with you, uh, it's a lot easier to have it right there in your box than it is to run, try to find a vet or find a friend that has the appropriate medication. So just keep a nice, what I call a first aid kit for your goats on hand. Um, of course, we keep a variety of brushes, our milk and equipment, um, things for utter health. Uh, keeping the mammary system clean. So when you milk out after the show, you know, you're doing it in a nice clean environment. And then of course you treat her just like you would at home, you know, with either fight back spray or rewashing the udder, you know, whatever it is that you would do at home to keep her healthy when she's at that show. Um, and of course, one of the first things that we do when we arrive at a show is cleanse the area that they're going to go in because you just don't know what's going to happen before we got there. So it's always a good idea to cleanse the area first before you bring your goats in. Yeah, I remember that one time when I was at a show, somebody said, last year, everybody that came to this show wound up with ringworm. <laughs> and that was just because there had been sheep in the pen. It was a fair show and there had been sheep in the pens the day before. Yes. <laughs> Which, needless to say, had me a little freaked out. <laughs> yes. And so they have these wonderful sprays. Um, one is, uh, what do they call it? It's a novel send type spray that you spray your pens with. But even a simple bleach water will do it. Or vinegar in water will, you know, will kill an awful lot of stuff that might be on those pens and in that concrete or, you know, dirt, whatever it is that you're going to be putting your animals in. And then you make sure you have nice clean bedding. But yeah, there's a lot of people complain of picking up stuff at shows. Fortunately for me, in all the years I've been showing, I have never brought a sick goat home from a show. Never. And I don't know if it's just because I've been lucky or if it's because I do bring them out and they have really hardy immune systems, you know, I, do, I really don't know. But we have not come home with any kind of bugaboos that other people typically, you know, they talk about coming home from the show with. So I've been very, very fortunate. The only thing we ever came home with was um, pink eye. Yeah, there's, because there's a show in Illinois the, it's like the biggest show it's not even the state fair but the the biggest show like fills up weeks before um the show and the pens there are no tack pens allowed even because every single pen is full of goats wow. and um i actually did not go to that one because my oldest daughter had her driver's license by then and when they came home they said just to let you know, we might have pink eye problem because they said there were so many flies mm -hmm. and the flies were getting into the goat's eyes. And, yeah. and we did, we, we wound up with a lot of the goats getting pink eye, but luckily that's transient. It's awful yeah. in the middle, but it, it is transient. It's really the least of your worries. You know, pink eye is not a big deal. Sore mouth even is not a big deal. It's, it's a nuisance but it's not a big deal. You know, once it runs its course, it's done, you know, and, um, and you do see that it shows too. I've been to a few national shows where uh, people brought in animals that had sore mouth and you go great, you know, and uh, now it didn't come home with me. So knock on wood, we did okay, you know, but there were animals there that did have it. And I know other herds contracted it, which is, you know, really unfortunate. Um, and then, uh, what's another ringworm, as you mentioned earlier, that's another one again, easy to deal with. It's just a nuisance, you know, and, and, but there are other things that are awful that uh, animals could come back with. And those things, we just, uh, you do your best, try to keep some separation between your herd and other herds. Uh, don't let them talk to each other through the panels, you know, things like that. And you can keep your herd relatively healthy 
when, you know, going out and enjoying yourself. One of the mistakes that we made at our very first show. So I, I like the fact that you said, make a list and be organized because when we went to our very first show, thankfully we only had one goat in milk with us. We, we brought one doe and milk and two kids. We did not take a milk stand. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, she was an absolute angel. She just stood there right in the middle of this wide open barn and let us milk her because not every goat would let you do that. Oh, they would not. <laughs> they would not. Uh, that one of the things that we have to do when we're at nationals, they, they'll pick a few animals that they want to milk out after the senior doe show is over to choose best udder. And the ones that are chosen have, you know, you have to milk them out right there in the show ring. Some people are able, you know, they, they've hauled their milk stand up there, you know, so they had me, I milk them on the ground, <laughs> you know, into my stainless steel bucket. And, uh, and so what I did was have my partner put the, the doe's head between her legs. And that way, if basically the doe was in a milk stand on the ground and she couldn't go anywhere. And then I just crouched down in there and I milked my doe out. Um, so milking on the ground is, is really not, I don't recommend it. <laughs> so if you ever go to nationals, <laughs> make sure you have a portable milk stand. It makes life a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah, that's another good tip. So this has been a lot of fun and, and super interesting and hopefully really helpful for people who've been curious about the possibility of showing. Do you have any final words of wisdom for somebody who wants to get started? Just do it. It's a lot of fun. It really is. Um, you will meet there. You know, a lot of times competition brings out the worst in people sometimes, but it also brings out the best in people. And I tell everybody, you know, welcome to the world of goats. Here we are. Uh, the people that are are not nice, don't give them the time of day. It's not worth wasting your time on. The people that are nice, those are the ones that are going to become your lifelong friends. And it can be a really, really good time. Go around, visit, you know, because everybody loves to talk goats. That's what people at shows do. We love our goats and we love to talk about our goats. So walk around and visit, introduce yourself. And, you know, and, and it's it's so much fun if you really go in there with a good attitude. That's awesome. That is a really great note to end on. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy.